Thanks, everybody, for joining this webinar about China's new normal, organized by Hutong School. For those who may not be familiar with Hutong School, Hutong School is a Chinese language institute based in China, uh, with uh, schools both in Beijing and Shanghai, as well as some programs in Hangzhou and Chengdu. Um, we organize both uh, intensive Chinese courses as well as internship programs uh, spe specifically tailored to people who don't have any previous China experience yet uh, and don't speak Chinese language yet. Um, however, tonight is not about Hutong School. Tonight is about China and more specifically topic innovation in China. Um, and for this purpose, we have invited tonight Mr. Pascal uh, Koppens, who is a sinologist from Belgium and who has more than 20, year, 20 years of hands-on entrepreneurial experience himself in China, uh, especially related to innovation. He's a very much sought-after uh, sought after guest speaker nowadays for keynote speeches. And we're really honored that we can have him here tonight for this webinar. Pascal, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Jan. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about innovation in China. And so I will start with saying that China has become the factory of the world. So anything we wear these days, anything we buy, the cell phones, the furniture, anything we can imagine in our lives, today are actually manufactured in China. This has taken China about 30 years to get to that status. And we're quite used to it. It's our new normal of the West. Everything is built in China. Now I predict that in 30 years from now, nothing is gonna come from China. It might sound strange what I'm saying, but I actually believe that in 30, 20 to 30 years from now, none of the products will actually be manufactured in China. There's going to be a big change. And why is that? It's because first of all, the products that were, are going to be built somewhere will not be affordable to be built in China anymore. The wages of Chinese are actually becoming closer and closer to the wages of the people in the West. The land in China is becoming extremely expensive. And so factories are moving out to another place. So China will change from made in China to create in China to innovate or innovation in China. And this is the topic of today. So we'll start about China's new normal and, and why I believe this is far, far from normal. What does China's new normal actually mean? It's, it's an expression from Xi Jinping, the president of the People's Republic of China, saying that the growth of China is not double digit anymore. It's actually going down all the way, 7, 6.7, 6.5, maybe even 6 or below percent in the future. So China is not that growth that we used to have before. So it's chaining to a normal growth. The second thing is that actually China is now changing from export and trade to domestic consumption. It's Chinese buying today. It's not the foreigners, the Westerners buying the goods only. Tomorrow, most of the domestic growth of most of the growth of China will actually be domestic growth. And that's a very, very big change in China. The third thing is that they want to innovate and they want to change. They want to become creators, not just made in China. And so all this is what will be the new, the new normal of China. But why do I believe this is not normal at all? is because we're going to have to understand or we're going to have to live with an environment where China will be part of our lives, not for what we made, that's made in China, but what we actually experience. So this is going to be a, a seminar about innovation in China. And let's start the seminar in the, just a second. Let's start it with a poll. Uh, the first poll is about a question about WeChat. And I would like to know in this poll, do you actually regularly use WeChat? And I don't know if you can see the poll on your left. I'm just sharing my screen. So either you say, I don't know what WeChat is. I've heard about WeChat, but hardly ever use it. Um, I use WeChat a lot in my communication. And for those experts, I use WeChat often. And I'm also buying services with WeChat. So if we can answer the poll, one of the four questions, it will give me an idea a little bit about uh, your experience with WeChat and indirectly with China.
All right, I so, see the majority of the people have voted already, so I give you a few more seconds and then we'll show the results of this uh, okay. poll. Okay, so I'll just um, wait a little bit, but uh, just, in, okay, this is very interesting. So I use WeChat a lot for communication, is what I see most. I don't see anybody so far using WeChat to buy services, so that makes me believe most of you are actually not living in China at this moment. I might be wrong, but at least I'm, I'm happy to say that most of the people are know what WeChat is. For those who don't know what WeChat is, we'll get into the, into the webinar a little bit further, uh, but WeChat is pretty much the social platform of China today. So. I'm going to start this presentation by explaining more about the new normal, which I explained before, and we'll start with Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping, which the economist uh, last month said the most powerful person on the planet. Is this true? Well, I believe it's starting to be true. So Xi Jinping said just about a year ago, before he was elected a second term, he said China should establish itself as one of the most innovative countries by 2020 and leading innovator by 2030. Now why 2020? 2020 as a year is very important because in 2021, just a year after that, the Communist Party of China is 100 years old. And so that means that there's an anniversary coming up, 100 years anniversary, that's a milestone for China and for the Communist Party. And they want to demonstrate to the world that they are leading or going to lead the world with innovation. This is a directive, a guideline directly from the top of China. And so a good friend of mine in the Chinese government, he said, when this happens, that China says, we all need to go in that one direction. What usually happens is everybody in business goes in the same direction. Why? Because there's gonna be a lot of money and a lot of market and a lot of opportunity coming out of that. Just single sentence. In 2030, we can predict China wants to be the number one in innovation. And it all sounds a little bit strange, and is it really possible? But this is what China believes themselves they can do. And if you look at the miracle of the last 30 years, I would really not be surprised they're gonna hit their target by 2030. So let's start with one of the richest people in China called Wang Jianlin. Wang Jianlin is a real estate investor he pretty much owns a lot of houses and, and apartments in China, uh, but also half of Hollywood is now starting to become part of his ownership. He said very, very clearly, he vows to change the world where the rules are set by foreigners. What does that mean? It means two things. First, it means that he understands that the, his ambition he has is a global ambition. So every business, every person in business in China today is changing from wanting to cover or conquer the Chinese market to a global market. So Chinese companies are going global. They want to change the global world, not the Chinese world. The second thing is that he knows that the rules outside of China, especially in the West, are set by foreigners. And so he understands, and most of the CEOs of big companies understand, if they want to sell outside China, they need to learn what the West is about. They need to learn about the innovation, about the culture, the society, the languages, the difficulties. They need to learn. And that's what they're going through today. The same as we had to learn 20 years ago to understand China. And still today, uh, all of you as well, we need to go to China to learn what's happening there. Otherwise, it's very difficult to really understand what the dynamics are, especially in the last years. I'm going to show a very, very short video from Joe Biden. Joe Biden, the vice president under Obama, the second person in command in the previous legislation, basically said something about China and innovation, which I want you all to listen to. I challenge you. Name me one innovative project, one innovative change, one innovative product that has come out. China. So it's mind boggling that the second person in charge in the US is telling everyone, there's thousands of students he's speaking to, telling everyone China cannot innovate. And this was just three years ago. 
while China was on the full speed of innovation. And I'll show more in the webinar what I mean by that. But that this perception of America, of the West, three years ago was still a reality. And still today, too many people don't believe China can create, China can innovate. So before we head into the innovation, I'm going to ask a second poll. In which innovation type is China really the strongest? If you could answer this four different uh, possible answers, and if you could just say either it's science-based innovation, so China is strong in science-based, are they strong in engineering-based, or rather efficiency-driven innovation, or consumer focused innovation. These are the typical four types of innovation that China is actually, or that the world is actually involved in. And China in particular is focusing on some of them. And if you could answer the poll, then I'll have an idea about what you believe uh, the type of innovation is typically the type that you see in China all along, especially in the last 10 years, 10, 15 years of its uh, development. All right, excellent. I see everybody has voted already, so that means we can show the results right away. Okay, so very interesting results. I actually did not expect these results. Uh, I expected it a little bit different. So science-based innovation, engineering-based innovation, and consumer-based, so it's efficiency-driven, is actually nobody voted for. Um, consumer, some did. Uh, and engineering as well, and even some science-based. And I'll give you a chart to ex show you the answer to that question. So this is a little bit of a complex chart, but if you look at it carefully, you see the four different types of innovation. And the blue dots in the middle actually demonstrate whether China is stronger than the rest of the world or weaker than the rest of the world. So if it's be beyond the fair share number one, so the first circle, uh, then actually China is stronger than the rest of the world. If it's within the circle, China is weaker or lagging behind. And what's very clear is that in science-based, and we're talking about biotech, semiconductors, fine chemicals, pharmaceutical, China is nowhere compared to the rest of the world. They need to catch up big time to get there. In engineering-based, they're slowly catching up. And in some areas, they're even leading innovation. If you look at high-speed trains like railroad equipment, wind turbines, communication equipment like telecom from Huawei, then you see they're actually going very, very well. In high-speed trains, they're the number one in the world. Better than Siemens, better than Alstom. Now, if you look at efficiency-driven, this is the strongest part of China. And it's actually interesting because the poll said nobody saw efficiency-driven as the strongest point. And I think it's because in the West, we usually believe, especially in countries like Germany, that we are extremely efficient. But what efficiency driven here means is that you have the best quality for the best price. It doesn't always mean you have the best quality. It means the best quality for the best price. Now, in many areas, it's also the best quality that you can get today. Now, consumer focused, this is catching up very, very fast and especially in the social media, in the software, in the retail, in smartphones, I mean, they're way ahead of the other countries, except maybe Samsung and iPhones, they're getting there, out there. So China's very, very strong in everything that's efficiency and customer focused, and the rest, they're moving up as they go along. Now I'm gonna go through six waves of innovation. The reason I'm doing that is to show you in my 20, 25 years of China experience is what I've seen change into the Chinese development of products. So I've taken more the hardware and software as examples because it's easy to understand. Uh, if I take biotech tech, it would be very complicated. But these are six wave that I've seen happen over the last 25 years. And we'll start with the first wave. The first wave is what I call the tech commodities. These are the Huawei's, the Hisense, the Lenovo's, the Hires, Satie, the companies that actually build good value for very good price. And it's cell phones, it's televisions, it's laptops, it's anything, usually electronic, usually in the south of China, the Shenzhen area, 
This is the tech commodity companies like Huawei on this picture, which started 25, 30 years ago, actually competing for the Chinese market. But some companies like Huawei actually very quickly went to the Indian market because they had to compete with Alcatel in China. And so they quickly learned how it was to go global. Now, what's interesting about these organizations is that they're multinational corporations today. So hundreds of thousands of people today working for them, for one company, one brand. Everywhere, even in, in Europe, you see R&D institutes, you see sales and marketing everywhere of these uh, first technology innovators. Their DNA is sometimes still a little Chinese. And what I mean by that is that the Chinese way of working sometimes long hours, hard work, very tough. Uh, they're not completely adopted yet to the foreign balanced life work type of work, type, type of life. So this was the first uh, innovation and this created other waves of innovation. The second one, which is actually a very interesting one and one that most people don't really understand being innovation is actually the cheap components, which I call the copycats. So why would a copycat be an innovator? In China, we have a word for it, it's called Shanzai. And basically it means those companies that created something from an existing model, especially hardware, and then adapted it to a specific niche market. Now, where does the innovation come in? You have to understand that most of these companies that have built these kind of products actually were working for the big multinationals in China. They were building cell phones, laptops, televisions, anything you could imagine, even digital watches and whatever. So they were actually getting more and more frustrated with the foreign companies. Why was that? The reason is that the foreign companies, and take Apple as an example, they would not listen to these engineers. They would not listen to these managers. When these managers said, you should put a second memory card in your Apple phone or a battery you can ex extract, nobody would care about it. But they believe very strongly the Chinese market needed that, or at least part of the market. So what they considered themselves was more like a Robin Hood type of environment where they were taking from the rich, giving to the poor. Now, reality is, over time, some of these fake goods, these people became filthy rich, and so you can't really call them Robin Hoods anymore. But that's the, the most important wave of innovation that happened in China, because that's where they learned from the West, but also learned from the market how to innovate. And this has been the creation and the start of all the other waves after it. The third wave is called connected commodities. And a name may be familiar is Xiaomi. It's, it's an iPhone manufacturer, very similar to the I, iPhones. So it's, it's a cell phone manufacturer that basically is changing the business model upside down. So what they did is that they, just from that second wave I explained before, they actually took the technology, they delivered it to the clients almost at cost price of the product. Compared to Apple, it was a third or half of the price that you, you should buy the exact same quality. Now, what they then did is they actually had a whole ecosystem of software and technology around it that you should buy to use. And that's what I mean, the connected commodities. So they were connecting any possible device. And Xiaomi today has hundreds of devices like fans, like radiators, like anything you can imagine that you can control with your cell phone. Interesting in that phase of innovation is that Hugo Barra, the person here on the right of the picture, is, was the VP of Google. He came to Xiaomi to actually tell to the world why Xiaomi is better than Apple. And in some places and in many places, he actually succeeded. So the Chinese companies understood to go global with their technology, they need to work with foreign talent, they need to work with creators, with marketeers, with communicators, otherwise they cannot get their product to the market. And Hugo Barra made that happen for Xiaomi. So this was the third wave of innovation, still very active today. The fourth wave, which I believe one of the most interesting to watch, is what we call the adaptable innovation. 
it means that they started from, again, a copy model, usually software, uh, a copy model, and typically are the Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, those companies we know, they copied Google, they copied Google Facebook, Amazon, and so on, or eBay. And what they did is not just did they copy it, because of course they did 20 years or 15 years ago, and Alibaba is now 19 years old. They started copying, but very quickly they improved the system. A little bit similar like in Japan 30, 40 years ago. They improved the system and adapted it for the Chinese market so we could quickly see products which were much richer than actually the products of the originator that they copied from. If you take WeChat, which I was in the first poll as an example, the social media is so much more than I would say Facebook or WhatsApp separately. It's a whole ecosystem. It's actually an operating system for the whole, your whole life in China. Baidu, as an example, which actually is the search engine of China, so the Google of China, is today the number one company in China building artificial intelligence for self-driving cars. And so I predict, I know for a fact, and it's actually on the roadmap of Baidu, that in two to three years from now, there will be self-driving cars in Shanghai city with Baidu software. And this is something I do not believe Google will be able to achieve simply because the American market or the American regulators won't allow this to happen. But the Chinese government will do it because they feel this will help their mobility problem. So companies like that are leapfrogging in front of their competitors from the West by innovation. Now the fourth type, the fifth type of innovation is very well known in the West because it's often in the press. It's when they acquire companies, they buy companies. So a typical example was KUKA, which was bought by Midea, KUKA being the number one German automation or robotics company in the world, bought by a Chinese company in Hangzhou, now using it in every factory in China. Or Volvo, which was purchased just seven years ago, so it's, it's already seven years, by um, Chile. Chile bought this company and then transformed it completely. Now, not many people know this, but Chile, eight, ten years ago, had a product called King Kong. It was the worst car you could imagine, the worst brand, and nobody in China took any notice on that brand. And just by buying Volvo, suddenly they became the number second brand, second brand in, the, in China uh, for automotive. Now, if you look at a company like Chile, then you see a new brand popping up called Link & Co. Link & Co is the new brand of Chile, actually positioning it exactly the same as Volvo, but then more in the Volkswagen category. Volvo, which they use as a brand and keep as a brand, is more the Audi of Chile. So they have two different positionings, the Volkswagen and the Audi. And so Link & Co will have all the innovation and all the R&D from Volvo in this car, but at a much better price. On the right, you see a number of pictures of people that are part of the R&D team in Sweden that was set up after the acquisition. It was like 100, 150 people that were doing top-notch innovation in Sweden for Volvo slash Chile. Today, talking about seven years later, the same institute has 2,000 developers, 2,000 people developing the best technology in automotive. And if you look at the languages in this, in this institute, in this lab laboratory, then you'll see that only 10% is actually speaking Chinese. So claiming that these acquisitions is actually to take over jobs is complete opposite than the reality that has shown us in the last five years of most companies that were acquired by Chinese. Most of the people in the West that have a Chinese owner today are actually pretty satisfied with their new environment because they're getting new funding, they're getting more people and a big market to sell their products to. And this actually drives innovation. It might be foreigners, Westerners, building it for Chinese, that doesn't really matter. It's a Chinese company innovating. The last of those six waves is actually what I call the pure innovators. This is only two, three years. Some of them are a little bit older, like DGI, 
here on the on the left, the drones company, but most of them are just a couple of years old. These are the innovators we are, which are very similar to the West. It's a new breed of startups and scale-ups. These companies actually start building products from scratch and building it much faster, good value, and globally from day one. So they become global startups from day one. And DJI, like on the left, if you see that drone, everybody in the world is using it. It's the best drone available today, the Spark drone. They're used in Hollywood movies. They're used in so many environments. Not many people know this is a Chinese company. And it's Chinese R&D. It's Chinese innovation. It's not just a copycat. And this you see more and more. The other interesting part about this is that many of these teams are not Chinese teams anymore. They're actually mixed teams. There's foreigners and Chinese working together to build the next generation of products. So this is a little bit a, a, a cap, a recap on the six waves of innovation. So every one of these waves is actually continuing. So it's not one after the other. And so all of them are pushing together to help China to innovate. And so I think Joe Biden is very, very wrong when he says China cannot innovate. So before we go further into the next part or the second part of this presentation, I would like to ask one last poll, and that would be, why would you spend one semester in China? And the answer to that is, it's an incredible market opportunity. It's the best place to basically have fun. You want to learn about Chinese culture and society, or you're looking for adventure and challenge. So what would you answer on any of these four? What would Maybe be your answer? Uh, clarify that you can choose multiple answers for this, uh, for this poll. Yes. Just don't choose four, because if everybody chooses four, I have no results helping me. <laughs> All right. I see almost everybody has voted. A few more people. A few more seconds. All right. Everybody has voted. Excellent. Let's have a look at the results. Very interesting. Um, OK. So a little bit like predicted from my side, um, that the second one, the best place to party and have fun, would actually be scoring pretty low. Um, although I must say, if that's what you want to do, Shanghai is probably the best place to go. And, and it's a very honest answer. And you will find what you're looking for, if that's your answer. Now, the first one, an incredible market opportunity, is the most common answer I actually get when I ask this question. Because in my previous companies in China, and I've lived there 20 years and had last 10 years I was an entrepreneur, I asked the same question at every interview for interns or, or, or employees. And most of them, foreign, foreigners, they actually answered the same, this first question. I always, say, I always felt like it's true, but that shouldn't be the drive to come to China. Because there's other places in the world which also has an incredible market opportunity. Think of India, Southeast, South Africa, think of Indonesia. So I'm not saying China is the only place to do this. If you look at the third one, to learn about Chinese culture and society, I think is critical to understand China. But I, I want to emphasize that it depends what you want to get out of that culture and out of that learning phase. Because if it is to learn about the history and the past about China, some of the people going there, some of you, might get disappointed. Because reality is that Chinese today are looking to the future. They're looking at making money, they're looking at, at actually improving, advancing their lives. And so their culture today is not the same as the culture we've learned from the past. And every 10 years, China has a new generation, so a new culture in itself, where here it takes 25 years for a generation, and China is going much faster. So if the last one, I think, is the real and the best uh, answer of all. If you believe that you're looking for adventure and looking for challenge, that's, in my view, the best motivation to go to China. Because China, although it's exciting and fun and, and you're going to learn a lot, it's not easy. And if you want to go through that challenge, that's where you're going to learn most. So I'll continue with the presentation. This is the second part. We're about halfway now. I hope you're all still okay. 
And this is going to be more about the new culture. So not just the new normal, but the new culture. And I'm talking about the new business culture or social culture, but in a business context. So we'll start with the first thing that I believe, and I've studied Chinese before, so I know how hard it is. I believe you don't need to try and crack the code. Don't try to understand what China is about. Even me, I've been working with China. I started in 1980 Chinese, and even today, I need my friends, my Chinese friends, to often tell me what certain things mean. And it's not that I don't understand everything. It's just that it's really hard to crack. And the main reason is because it's changing constantly. So you're a few months out of China, or you meet some new experience, and you just can't play it anymore. So China is not about trying to crack the code, in my view. China is about living the experience, being part of Chinese society, so that you actually can recognize the patterns, both in business and in culture and in social context. So it's not about learning only, it's about experiencing. So whenever I talk about China, and I do that pretty much constantly, there's two different uh, receptions I get or people's reaction I get. You have the people who wonder about China and say, wow, it's magical, it's, it's crazy, it's enormous, it's fast, it's, it's so exciting. And then you have a lot of people in the West saying, China is not, bad, is not good, there's bad things, there's going to be bad things happening, there's a bubble, it's going to burst, uh, the, the economy is not stable, pollution, so a lot of bad things. And in a way, everybody's right and everybody's wrong. But how do Chinese look at their own market? And that's something we need to look at. So instead of looking at China itself, we need to understand how Chinese look at China. And so there's a word called harmony or hexie in Chinese. And harmony is actually looking at the past and the future by the same person, looking at positive and negative with the same person. In Europe or in the West, it's often binary. It's often that person is more positive, that person is more negative. In China, you find the same context in the same person. And so China is all about projection and protection. Whether it's business or in other, other um, environments, it's all about looking to the future, having big dreams, big goals, moving forward, but always looking back like, am I taking the, rep, the right steps? And in China, we call that stepping stones, which means you take one step, you test it out, and if it works, you take the next step. If it doesn't work out, you quickly go back. And so as long as you move quickly, you can actually move along pretty interestingly, faster than many others who look more at understanding and reasoning than actually feeling from their heart. So this is what China is often about. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to separate uh, what I believe China is strong at compared to what I believe Europe or the West is strong at. And so I believe China is extremely strong in addressing the market. So I made a two word clouds to explain that. The first word cloud is actually about the goods, the products, the services. China is looking at customers. They're looking at market. They're looking at actually taking market share in the West, in Europe. In, in the West in general, what we look at is the foundation of the company. The value of a company in China is its consumers, is its market, is its speed, its revenue. In Europe, the value of a company is often its technology, its organization, its foundations, its leading or first companies to the market. So they're number one. So they have a, a big leapway and that's usually true technology. So China looks at value different from the West. If we in the West want to sell our technology, bring it to China, then China says, okay, but you need our market, and that's our biggest value. So how about we trade? China, Western companies then often say, this doesn't work like that. I give you my technology, you have to pay me. So this is a little bit where the context uh, can be complicated. But this is why what defines China. If we look at growth, we see that China has grown from 2% from to 15% in GDP in just 20 years. And now the purchasing power parity, which means the amount of money people have to buy things, has actually become the biggest in the world. So Chinese consumers have more money 
than American consumers or European consumers. And that's the message we should understand. And this is shown in the, the sales on Alibaba, the e-commerce site, uh, on Singles Day. Singles Day is a shopping festival on November 11. And there we saw that in 24 hours, they sold just two weeks ago, $25.4 billion in sales. That's the GDP of many smaller countries in the world, just in one day, 24 hours. Chinese customers, Chinese consumers have money like crazy. They know that they want to spend. Very different from previous generation who were saving. So their parents and grandparents saving money. They're spending money of their parents and grandparents, but also their own money they're spending. So China's changing to domestic, actually, consumption and growth. Now, to understand innovation, difference between Chinese company and a Western company, I made this graph. And so you can see that a Chinese company is actually focused on making money from day one. Very short-sighted, very short-term. They want to make money. And innovation or technology is the second most important thing. Once they are big, they made a lot of money, they're powerful, and suddenly, their market might be challenging because they might have competitors or the market doesn't grow anymore. That's when they start to innovate. And then they invest lots of money into innovation. That's why the revenue goes down. In the West, it's different. When we start a company, we first innovate. We first invest in intellectual property and in building products, building things. And then gradually we go to market. We find funding and then we make it to the market. So very different way of looking. The Chinese way might take longer in the long run, but the growth might be much faster. And this is what we've just seen today. A, a company like Tencent, the owner of WeChat, has become bigger in valuation than Facebook. First time in history. So this is something that is really happening. Now, if we compare money against brands, I believe that money is not any problem in China anywhere. If you look at billionaires, there's more billionaires in China than in the US today. Now, more important than that is that the new billionaires globally are actually for 70% coming from China. So there's a billionaire every week, two, three billionaires every week coming from China. Money is available everywhere. Now, what's important about that is that most of these billionaires are actually entrepreneurs. They're self-made entrepreneurs and they are putting their money back into the industry, back into the companies. So it's an ideal place for a startup, for a scale-up. You get money from people who made it. Second thing is the government, because that's a, an important part of the innovation. The government, three, four, five years ago, was not spending money on innovation, on startups, on scale-ups. Everything was going to big projects. That has changed. Since two, three years, the government is pouring money into innovation. If you remember, it's to reach that date of 2020. They want to show that they can innovate. And so $336 billion is available for startups. So if you're a startup with a good product and a market, and you don't find money in China, then this must be something really wrong. So this is the reality of China today. Now, what we are very good at in Europe, especially in Europe, is building brands. It's not just about innovation. This is about emotional connection with the consumer. The cars like a Porsche, a BMW, an expensive watch, Belgium chocolates, because I'm from Belgium. These are emotional things. The Chinese value that. And that's something they still haven't figured out how to get around that. How can they build brands that people love, not just buy because of the good price or the good, the good value, but actually people are falling in love with these brands. This is a value that we have built over the generations of time, which we can educate and help the Chinese to learn. They really want to learn this. And why is it so important for them? Because for them, having these brands, owning these brands is a symbol of advancement. They want to be as good, as powerful, as strong-minded as, Western, as Westerners. And so they're looking to create those brands. And so I believe in the next 10, 20 years, China will have brands of its own that we will buy every single day. So we won't be my, buying made in China, we will be buying create in China. And that's a big difference for the future. Now the next one I want to talk about is talent versus efficiency. 
So where do you find good talent in China? Is there a good talent in China? Well, you can find it, for example, on a job fair in Shanghai. This is crazy. I've been on one of those little boots or one of those little boots I've, I've worked at to get this done the whole day. It's just your whole day is ruined if you have to stay there the whole day. But there's no lack of talent and people in China. And it's not all low skilled jobs. There's actually high skilled education jobs in China. There's Seven million people graduating from university every year. So to compete with this mass of talent, it's just terrible. It's difficult as a foreigner, and I've done it. It's so hard to compete in this market. So we have to find what we're good at. Now, Apple CEO, Tim Cook, <clears throat> is today building an R&D institute or an R&D facility in the south of China, which is going to spend half a billion dollars. Because he's saying very clearly, some of the best electronic engineers in the world are in China. He cannot find enough engineers in Silicon Valley. He has to go to China to find the engineers to build the next iPhone. So <clears throat> this is a reality. China has more talent than actually we think we know about. Now, if we go back to the efficiency of the talent, which is a very different topic, then we can see that uh, Nahal Marcus, which is a, a Belgium private bank, was bought by Anbank Securities just two years ago. And this CEO who came from China basically said, in China, when you train, when you hire people, you have to train them, you have to coach them. It's hard to trust them in the beginning. It takes time. And that's a reality I've experienced for 15 years in China. HR is one of the biggest headaches in China. And the other issue is that there's so many jobs and so many opportunities that people stay one year, two years, they're gone. So why train them? In Europe, it's much different. We have a work ethic that is much, much more stable for Chinese companies. And they've noticed it. That's why they want to develop European R&D, European teams for their Chinese market and later their global market. So big difference happening today. Agile versus meaning. You cannot beat Chinese in speed. They're always faster when they go to market. It's very, very difficult to understand it, but I'll give you one simple example, and there's many of them that you will understand that we just cannot follow, especially when it's about the Chinese market, and especially when there's a lot of hurdles and problems, like legislation, like IP rights, like HR, like, like getting a business license. There's a lot of problems in China. Chinese just run over all these problems and they figure it out. One example I want to show is Mobike. This is a Shanghai company, a bike sharing company. Some of you might have heard about it already. Mobike is actually a very, very smart system. So the bike is, uh, has on the end a lock and it has a QR code. You take your Mobike app, you scan the QR code and the lock goes open. You take the bike, you drive it anywhere. It's a very high quality bike. You drive it to the subway station or to your work and then you just leave it in front of your work. You don't need to park it anywhere or go anywhere. You leave wherever you, you can. So it's very flexible. Now this company, and you can read it below, has raised $1 billion in just one year time. That is the speed of investment in China. But they've also reached 9 million active users every day using these bikes. Together with Ofo, their competitor, today they have 30 million bikes on the streets in 100 cities in China. That is the speed of China. In Europe, we wouldn't even be possible to manufacture 30 million bikes in 18 months. So this company, Mobike, I visited them one and a half year ago. They were very, very small. Two years ago, they didn't exist. This is the speed of China. It's just one extreme example, but this is not the only example. Next step for Mobike is going global. They're already in Singapore, they're in Japan, they're in the UK, they're in the US, they're in California, they're now coming to Europe. This company is born global startup, like the sixth type of innovators that I mentioned, born global. And a friend of mine is actually running their international department, so I know very well it's not just a pure Chinese type 
company. They actually have a global view and global experience in the company, and they're covering the whole world now. They want to become the number one bike sharing company globally. This is the example of speed. If we compare that with Europe, then we see that most of the startups take like five years to get funded. Four or five years, that's a long time. And the average funding they get is a few million euros for most companies. And we're talking about the best companies in Europe. So comparing one by the other, it's just, there's no comparison. And that's a little bit my story, is that if you want to compete on speed, you're probably going to lose. So you need to find other things to compete on. Now, one thing I believe is that slow is beautiful. So the speed is great in China, but it's also exhausting. So Chinese are looking for ways to build things that are more profound, that have foundation, that basically are more analytic, are more research done. This is something we are very good at in Europe. Chinese not. They don't have time or patience for it. So our slowness is actually an added value. It may sound strange, but this is what I believe. Now, the, the last thing, or one last thing, is the user-centricness versus data-driven. Chinese companies, Chinese CEOs, they focus on their clients. I've always learned in Europe that we are customer-focused, customer-centric. But in China, this is just going to another extreme. People, companies, understand what customers want, and they go in depth to understand what they can offer these customers. One example is Xiaozu. Xiaozu is actually the copy of Airbnb, so the renting out apartments online. Basically, what Xiaozu does different from Airbnb is that Xiaozu has like thousands of consultants. And these consultants, they will go into the rooms of the tenants, so the people who rent out the rooms, and will help them to change the rooms. They will say, you need to paint your walls in a different color. Maybe get different bed sheets. Maybe get another lock on your door. If you do all that and you listen to me, I guarantee you're, you can rent your home at a higher price. And so it's a win-win. These consultants even help them to go and buy the paint if needed. So this is a very different business model, but this is what I mean by customer centricity. This is something that China is very strong at, and it's something we in the West believe we're strong at, but in China, it has a different dimension. Now, one of my friends, William Baobin, who's running the China Accelerator, the number one accelerator in China, it's in Shanghai, always said Chinese are not good at mathematic, mathematics. It's a little bit weird because they win all the mathematics competition. But why would you say they're not good at mathematics? The reason is because the good mathematicians they actually go abroad or they get scooped up by the big multinationals or big companies like Baidu and Tencent. And so the problem is that there's not enough people that actually are willing to spend the time on the deep knowledge. So data-driven uh, innovation is very difficult for China. And this is contradictory to the fact that China is the country with most data. So Tencent has huge data, Baidu has huge amount of data, but they don't have the scientists to analyze it. So the data is a little bit lost. And there's an opportunity for the West, who actually we like to analyze things. And so we can build or help Chinese to make sense of all their data. And so we can work together. The last one I want to show is personal versus business. So I've explained a little bit about WeChat, and people very often compare it with WhatsApp. But actually, it's so much more. It's Facebook, Google Maps, PayPal, it's Amazon, I mean, Ball.com, whatever you can think of, everything is in this one app. And so the nice thing about WeChat is that it makes your life much more efficient because you don't need 20 different apps to do 20 different things. But why is this possible? The main reason this is possible is because business and personal actually mix in China. What it means is that in China, Chinese citizens, Chinese people want to do business with their friends. Because if you trust each other, it's much safer, especially in an environment with so many people. In the West, we usually don't want to do business with our friends because if it goes bad, then basically we lose our friend. So a very different context. And so Chinese will work six days a week with their colleagues, and on the seventh day, they will go on a holiday again with their colleagues to another city. So business and friends, it's all one. And so WeChat, besides all these apps, also has all the possible websites in the world you could imagine 
on this one app. So you don't need laptops anymore, just your mobile phone, one app, and your life set. And that's the difference with WeChat. So this is something where personal and business has a different meaning. Now, I do not believe that working so hard and working seven days a week with your colleagues is actually the right way to continue. And most of the Chinese companies realize now that as the market gets more mature, as their employees want more rights and actually wants to achieve more self-satisfaction, they actually want to find ways to have a better life work balance. And so the work smarter that we are so proud of in the West is something that you now see happening in China as well. And again, this is where we can work together because they're looking at us as an example. And so this concludes my presentation. I would like to invite you all, if you want to learn about China, not to stay here, take your luggage, go to China, get inspired what's happening there. It's moving at lightning speed, but you can only understand China by being there and seeing the patterns that I've learned to see over the last 20 years.